A warm welcome to our viewers here in Nigeria and all over the world. A happy Easter. You're watching the world today. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Here's what's coming up on the program. Pakistani court suspends former Prime Minister Imran Khan's jail sentence in a case related to illegal selling of state gifts. Turkey's main opposition party claims big election victories in the main cities of Istanbul and Ankara. Welcome to the program. Once again, Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan could walk out of jail a free man. That's after the Islamabad High Court suspended his jail sentence in a case related to illegal selling of state gifts. Khan and his wife Bushra Bibi were each handed a 14-year sentence in the case on January 31st, ahead of the February 8th general elections. A court said the sentence will remain suspended until a decision is taken on the case after the Eid holidays, which begins in 10 days. The 71-year-old Khan is accused of not disclosing assets based on the sale of state gifts worth more than 140 million rupees he received when he was the country's prime minister from 2018 to April 2022. The sentencing had made the couple ineligible to contest full public office for 10 years, while also slapping a fine of 787 million rupees on each of them. Stay with the courts, but this time in India, Delhi Chief Minister and key opposition leader Arvind Kejriwal has been sent to jail until April 15 in a corruption case less than three weeks before the country begins voting in a seven-phase national election. Reports in the country say the Enforcement Directorate arrested Kejriwal last month in connection with allegations related to New Delhi's liquor policy and had been remanded to the agency's custody until April 1st today. Lawyers said Kejrawal had been non-cooperative and was given evasive replies, asking the court to remand him to judicial custody for 15 days. His AM Admi party, AAP, says he has been falsely arrested in a fabricated case ahead of the polls but Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government and his Bharatiya Janata party deny political interference. Kajriwal blames Modi for his arrest, telling reporters on his way to court, what the Prime Minister is doing is not good for the country. Staying in India, the foreign ministry says at least 250 citizens have been rescued in Cambodia, where they were forced to run online scams. The victims had been duped of at least 5 billion rupees in the past six months. Jobs were promised, but the people were forced to undertake illegal cyber work. More than 5,000 Indians stuck in Cambodia were forced to cooperate with cyber fraud schemes. So says the Indian Foreign Ministry, hundreds of thousands of people from around the world are estimated to have fallen prey to human traffickers running job scams in Southeast Asia. Victims, mostly young and tech savvy, are promised jobs and then lured into illegal online work ranging from money laundering and crypto fraud to so-called love scams where they pose as lovers online. According to a UN report in August last year, at least 120,000 people in Myanmar and another 100,000 in Cambodia were forced into cooperating cyber fraud schemes. In Turkey, the main opposition party has claimed big election victories in the main cities of Istanbul and Ankara. It follows elections that took place over the weekend. The poll results are a significant blow for Tayyip Erdogan, who had hoped to regain control of the cities less than a year after he claimed a third term as president. Mayor Ekrem Imamoglu of the Republican Party's People's Party said he defeated the governing development party, that's the AK party candidate, by more than one million votes. According to officials, the CHP prevailed in 36 of Turkey's 81 provinces. Opposition supporters wasted no time to celebrate in Istanbul, with tens of thousands of them lighting torches and waving Turkish flags. About 16 million people were, in, were eligible to vote for mayors, provincial council members, and other local officials in the local elections held on Sunday. The reported turnout was around 76% across the country. Welcome back to the program. Six people have been injured in a fire at a Brooklyn church in New York. It's happened as people gathered for the Easter service on Sunday. 
Firefighters, police officers and medical staff arrived on the scene, working on the site in the aftermath of the blaze, carrying fire escape ladders and ropes and patrolling the area. Residents could be seen watching and filming the incident. At least 44 fire engines res responded to the blaze at Our Lady of the Rosary Pom of Pompeii Church in East Williamsburg shortly before 2 p.m. local time. A cause of the fire remains under investigation. South Korean President Yoon Suk Yeol has pledged not to back down on plans to increase medical school admissions as he accused striking doctors of operating as a cartel. In an act addressed to the nation on Monday, Yoon said the planned addition of 2,000 medical school places was the minimum needed. He said the number 2,000 is not a random figure we came up with. We have thoroughly reviewed relevant statistics and research and reviewed present and future medical situations, adding that the government reforms aim to create a medical environment where all people can receive treatment with peace of mind. He says doctors opposed to the plans should stop making threats and present a unified blueprint with clear scientific reasoning. Southern Africa is under a famine and drought watch, which has taken its toll on relief efforts across countries such as Zambia and Malawi. And both countries have declared national disasters, and Zimbabwe is said to be on the brink of doing the same. The drought in these countries is said to have reached crisis levels. Angola, Mozambique, Madagascar have been drenched by deadly tropical storms and floods since last year. The vicious weather cycle is said to have made things worse for the world's most vulnerable people. The United Nations Children's Fund says there are overlapping crises of extreme weather in eastern and southern Africa, with both regions lurching between storms and floods and heat and drought in the last year. In southern Africa, an estimated 9 million people, half of them children, need help, especially in Malawi. As bringing Channel Television's correspondent in South Africa, Innocent Samosa, he joins me now from Johannesburg. Innocent, great to see you. It's interesting that this report is about Southern Africa, but then South Africa as a country is not mentioned. Have there been reports of weather conditions worsening in the country so much it is impacting food production? Yeah, well, a very good evening to you, colleague, and our viewers around the world. Um, yeah, indeed, according to Status say, the fourth quarter of 2023, South Africa's economy experienced a subdued growth, um, Amarachi, uh, with the agricultural sector facing significant challenges. Um, the agricultural, um, agriculture, forestry, and fishing the these sectors have had a notable you know tough quarter uh, shrinking by 9.7 percent of course we do know that the decline was mainly driven by the production figures um for various categories i mean i've been speaking to farmers here in johannesburg and of course they are raising a lot of uh, you know, uh, issues around the weather patterns that um, it takes time to rain. And when it does rain, it rains with hail and it destroys their, um, you know, their crops. In fact, the the it, it's it's the green beans is about to hit their shelves. Uh, but farmers are telling me that that will depend on Mother Nature uh, because of the challenges of the the this weather patterns. Yeah. Um, yeah, it has been a challenging, challenging time, Amarachi, but we do know that the El Nino, uh, which is normally occurring, you know, the climatic phenomenon that uh, warms the Pacific Ocean every two to seven years has continued uh, to contribute in this particular decline. As you rightly put, the drought in Zimbabwe, neighboring uh, Zambia and Malawi has reached really a crisis, crisis level, uh, Amarachi. So South Africa is on the brink also of experiencing a drought uh, because of the weather conditions. Innocent, give us an idea of the situations in the other surrounding nations that you have also mentioned, Zambia, Malawi, even Zimbabwe. They share borders with South Africa, at least I know Malawi and Zimbabwe. What intervention efforts have been made by South Africa to these countries? Yeah, well, it's um, it's it's a challenging times um for 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 the region, I must say. Uh, but uh, like you rightly put, 
the Namibian, should I say, Malawian president, Lazarus Chakwere, has also appealed some 200 million US dollars in uh, humanitarian assistance. This just goes to show you that um, he's really feeling the pinch of this, um, um, you know, heat and challenges. But we do know that the University of Mangosuthu University of Technology in KwaZulu Natal is partnering with the Florida University of uh, uh, of America. They are really bringing farmers. Um, they are bringing technology people to young people to really find ways um, to mitigate. You know, find better ways um, um, to adapt to. You know this challenging weather conditions um so i know that there are countries in the sadek region that are um uh, invited to be part of this um, um uh, particular session it will of course be taking place later this year um in kwazulu natal province so we're hoping that interventions that are taken there or resolutions that are tabled there would really go a long way in assisting farmers, in assisting them to adapt to this, uh, uh, you know, challenging weather uh, patterns, uh, uh, Marachi. Has it also impacted on immigration? Because I'm imagining the people in search for uh, better uh, soil conditions and all of that would be moving to better climatic conditions. And you seem to have that in South Africa. Has it been a problem, you know, for authorities trying to, to, to stave off illegal migration? Indeed, uh, the challenge of immigration has been a long-standing issue where we've been seeing numbers coming from um, the likes of um, uh, Malawi and, and Zimbabwe. And because also our, our borders are quite porous, uh, Marachi, and it becomes a challenge for um you know for for the country to really know how many people are in the country because some of them come illegally so um it, it becomes really challenging because you don't know whether or not it's the corruption that takes place in the borders or these people are just really walking past our fence um it, it's it's a really challenging time because south africa is not uh, affected like the other countries in terms of the heat. Um, we do have the challenge of the heat waves, but uh, it's not affected like the other countries. As you've heard, um, we heard that it's not a normal circumstances that, um, uh, you know, uh, some locals in Zimbabwe have also mentioned that they remember this type of drought was in 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 1947 that's a long time ago um and uh, and and the current heat, heat wave uh, amarachi is impacting on agricultural production in the region um yeah we've been seeing a number a number of people and i i, I tell you now that many political parties are riding on this they're telling people that they're going to actually remove all the illegal foreigners but I don't know how they're going to do that, but I guess it's the season for campaigning. Political party leaders will tell people anything they want to say to woo votes, I guess, because we're in election season, um, Amarachi. I can only imagine uh, what the campaigns look like, uh, innocent. And I'm just wondering, you know, when these illegal migrants come into South Africa, what aspects of the economy are they headed towards? Um, if most of them were farmers coming from Zimbabwe and Malawi, are they heading towards the agricultural sector? Uh, are they also being effective there or are they just constituting a nuisance in the country? Um, not in the agricultural sector, but majority of them, we see them in the restaurants, uh, particularly in Cape Town. Um, we see them in the restaurants, in the hotels, they're doing housekeeping. Um, yeah, but, but not really contributing to the agricultural sector, uh, but mostly it's the, um, informal sectors. For an example, uh, the, 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 the entrepreneurs, they will be fixing things, electrical appliances. Um, these are the jobs that do, uh, likely take, but not in the agricultural sector. I don't think those illegal immigrant immigrants when they come to the country they don't really coming to look for uh, jobs in farming or whatever because some of them really they are quite educated and they they are they are quite educated they've got qualifications and they can speak very well so um it gives them the 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 upper hand on locals who somewhat they feel like they're entitled to some of the 
uh, um, you know, to some of the opportunities that present themselves. But I guess this is what South Africans need to understand, that you need to work for opportunities. You can't just sit around and, and, and wait for government to do something for you. Wow. And I know that you'd mentioned this earlier, uh, in a sense, uh, the role of SADC, uh, the regional body in Southern Africa. And I'm wondering, you know, how much more they have done for countries such as Mozambique and Madagascar. Uh, I know that, you know, when you talk about Mozambique and Madagascar, you're talking more of Eastern Africa. But those countries have been battered by storms, which have greatly impacted on food production. Is this an issue that, that is raised regularly at regional meetings? and the interventions that have been done and the ones that are planned? Yeah, well, in fact, the, the recent SADC climate change strategy and action plan document, uh, it, it does speak about priorities, strategies, interventions, and uh, actions for adoption uh, in, 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 in given the association, uh, I mean, given the associated vulnerability uh, of the region to climate change. Uh, but in terms of the agricultural sector, we, we, we know that mostly they, that they do talk about promoting water supply, conservation, and um, uh, related infrastructure development. It has been, infrastructure has been a challenge for many countries in the region, um, uh, Amarachi. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because of the farmers that I've, I've, I've you know, I've interacted with. Um, they have issues of, you know, challenges of electricity and challenges of water also, you know, because there's the issue of load shedding, but they've got pumps. Those pumps, they use electricity to actually get water when there's load shedding it's a challenge you get a generator you have to fix you have to service the generator it now it's 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 a cost again so um infrastructure development it has been uh, on top of the agenda but we also know that uh, they want to promote the use of adaptive agricultural technologies and techniques um, to promote incentives for the development of green um, um, agribusiness development for the region frame, framework. This is the, 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 the body of the agricultural research in SADC region. But also they want to promote the interventions that improve uh, resilience among vulnerable communities um, as what we have, uh, you know, witnessed. Uh, what we're witnessing in our neighboring countries. Uh, but it does seem as though the battle is far from over, uh, uh, Amarachi. We can only hope for the best. Yeah, indeed, hope for the best. In a sense, you take care of yourself. Thank you again for joining us on the program. Thank you, colleague. We're in Western Africa now. The Togolese president, Foreign Asingbe, has announced the controversial constitutional reform bill be tabled again in parliament. According to a statement from the president's office, President Nasimbe invokes the interest aroused by the adoption of the bill and the perfectible nature of the law to justify the request for a second reading. The legislation, initially passed by parliament on March 25th, has faced criticism from opposition parties who view it as a ploy to consolidate Nasimbe's domination over the structure of power in Togo. The proposed constitution grants parliament the power to choose the president, doing away with direct elections. It makes it likely that Nasimbe would be re-elected when his mandate expires in 2025. The UN Refugee Agency is raising alarm as ongoing violence in eastern areas of the Democratic Republic of Congo reach a devastating level. Renewed clashes between the Congolese army and the M23, a non-state armed group, have triggered massive displacement in recent days, exacerbating an already dire humanitarian situation for thousands. <laughs> Asifawe Peruzi and her eight children fled their home last December when fighting spread to their neighborhood. The family now lives at the Rosayo displacement site in Goma. We fled our homes because of fighting. It first started in Mushaki. We thought it would not spread to our area because there were so many soldiers there. We felt safe. Later, the soldiers left and we were worried about our safety. We started hearing gunfire and bombing in the hills. Many bullets were fired near our home area. In recent weeks, a staggering 297,000 people have arrived in the provincial capital of Goma, North Kivu province. 
Many live in poor and cramped conditions with little or no access to food, health services and education. I fled with my six children while bombs and gunshots were resounding. Since we arrived here, we haven't received any assistance and we're hungry and do not know what to do. The health of my child is worrying. I am terrified and stressed. For my child to be in this severe state means she's getting very little healthy food. Since the eruption of renewed violence on the night of the 18th of March 2022 in the North Kivu province between government forces and non-state armed groups, the conflict has inflicted a staggering toll on civilian populations. Aid agencies have raised alarm about the increase in civilian casualties and the use of heavy weapons in populated areas in recent weeks. Since violent clashes enveloped Sake in Masisi territory on the 7th of February, almost 300,000 people have arrived in Goma and its surroundings, swelling spontaneous and official displacement sites as they desperately seek shelter from indiscriminate bombing and other human rights abuses. Conditions are dire as growing needs for shelter, sanitation and livelihood opportunities outstrip available resources. A further 85,000 people have fled that same violence and sought shelter in Minova, South Kivu. In January, the town of Minova already hosted over 156,000 displaced people with the majority in makeshift shelters. Some UNHCR teams are bleak. Families continue arriving at sites traumatized and exhausted by the attacks, scarred physically and psychologically. Many report being abused, some sexually, during their flight. According to the World Food Programme, around a quarter of DRC's population, 23.4 million people, are facing crisis levels of hunger or worse. <laughs> We, as the World Food Programme, we have to be there to give food assistance, to give cash, to make sure that these families don't face hunger, these mothers don't turn around and say, I have no food to feed my children. And we also have to keep telling the international community, don't give up on these people, don't ignore these people, and don't let this situation be tolerated. Far from the country's capital, Kinshasa, eastern Congo has long been overrun by more than 120 armed groups seeking a share of the region's gold and other resources while carrying out massacres. The result is one of the world's largest humanitarian crises, with an estimated 7 million people displaced, many of whom are beyond the reach of aid. Welcome back. History will be made tomorrow, April 2nd, as President-elect of Senegal, 44-year-old Basiro Diomaye will be sworn in as the country's fifth leader. Faye's election was validated by provisional results announced last Wednesday and confirmed by the Constitutional Council on Friday after he won more than 54% of the votes cast on March 24th. Much earlier, my colleague Laya Olarinde spoke to the VOA's regional correspondent, Mariama Diallo, who's in Dakar, Senegal's capital, monitoring preparations for the upcoming inauguration. It's good to have you in West Africa. Now, how are preparations going for tomorrow's inauguration? I imagine much excitement and anticipation. Absolutely. To say the least, a lot of excitement, anticipation, obviously, uh, knowing what the country has been uh, going through the past few weeks, the past few months, after an attempt by the outgoing president, uh, Macky Sall, to postpone the election uh, by 10 months to December, uh, I think everybody just has been very, very excited. Uh, they've been amazingly uh, kind of surprised that the elections actually did take place uh, on March 24th. A new president has been elected and he's about to be sworn in. Uh, when you look at, when you talk about preparations and you look at the avenue, it's called the Avenue de la République, which, uh, which leads to the presidential palace, it's very well decorated. When you uh, also, uh, in that same area, make that left uh, to head to the Place de l'Independence, uh, also very well, uh, nicely decorated. It's almost, it looks almost like Christmas, but it is decorated uh, with the Senegalese colors, as you can see the flag, uh, the green uh, yellow and red, uh, which are the colors of the Senegalese flag, of course. Uh, 
uh, with that star uh, in uh, in the middle uh, of that flag. Yes, absolutely. Uh, lots of, I mean, it's Ramadan, obviously, uh, for the Muslims, and they're looking forward to end this month. Uh, but the Christians just uh, celebrated Easter. Uh, so I think, you know, the excitement uh, is just everywhere. It's, it's definitely popular. Now, at the age of 44, Basiru Diomayefaya becomes Africa's youngest president. Now, what are the Senegalese people, you know, expecting from their new uh, young leader by the time he picks up his mandate? It's interesting you talk about his age at 44 years old, because I was just working on a piece today looking uh, into, you know, just Africa uh, in general and the, the lessons to be learned uh, from these latest elections in Senegal. And one country that I uh, touched on was Cameroon, Cameroon's name, uh, a neighboring country to you guys, uh, where you have a president uh, that is in his 90s, almost 91 years old. So the total opposite, like almost the double of the age uh, of this newly elected president. But, uh, you know, I think the expectations are high uh, from uh, the young people here. Uh, the leader has talked about, uh, Jamai Fai, Basir Jamai Fai has talked about uh, basically, uh, you know, trying to kind of tackle some of the, 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 the institutions, how they have been affected by what happened in the past few months. He's talked about tackling corruption. He's talked about also helping uh, to kind of alleviate this high cost of living. But I think for the youth, uh, it has a lot to do. I think every, most people that I spoke, uh, that I spoke to uh, during this coverage talked about jobs. It's jobs, jobs, jobs. It's Easter Monday today and the Easter holiday in Nigeria afforded people the opportunity to relax and spend more time with family and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the commercial city of Lagos residents attended the yearly Easter fiesta organized by the state government. Lagos State First Lady, Dr. Ibijoke Songwulu, whose message was delivered by wife of the Deputy Governor, Mrs. Uluremi Hamzat, called on children to obey their parents, shun all forms of social vices, and be committed to their education. It's fun time for these children who are privileged to attend the Lagos State 2024 Family Easter Fiesta at the Lagos House at Lausa Ikeja. All kinds of games and other fun activities are available for them to have the most memorable Easter celebration. It is an annual event organized by the office of the First Lady, Dr. Ibijoke Sonwolu, who is also here alongside the wife of the Deputy Governor, Mrs. Uluremi Hamzad, to celebrate with the children. While they have fun, parents in attendance listen to a message on the power of resurrection. Resurrection, when we talk about resurrection, it is, we're talking about when Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ was arrested, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came to this world. We celebrated his birthday. Now it's time to celebrate the pupils and also give them a sense of belonging. The cognitive, effective, and also the psychomotor aspects. And which has to do with the total learning process of our children. We read. We know, we recognize certain things, and then we also practicalize them. That's the whole essence of learning. The essence of the program is just to encourage the students to bring them close, to let them have a feel that they are well recognized and they are expected to behave well, to know that the future of this country uh, belongs to them. They should have sense to give them sense of belonging is not about the other people alone governance is inclusive mrs amzat reads the first lady's speech highlighting the need for children to imbibe the spirit of tolerance and peaceful coexistence 
This is the advice for our mommy. Beyond the celebration, I encourage you not to lose track of the significance of the Easter season. I urge you all to invite the track of spirit of the spirit of tolerance, peace coexistence, and sacrifice for one another. You have to love and one another, be a good help to each another. You have to make sure that you stay away from sin. Always help mommy, help daddy. You always, 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 always have to be humble. No dull moment at all for the children as they are engaged in several competitions and gift items are presented to the lucky winners. The family Easter fiesta was introduced by Mrs. Sonwolu in 2021 as a landmark event in line with the essence of the season and has been sustained over the years. As we rewind now ahead to the Catholic Church, where Pope Francis called on for a ceasefire in the Gaza Strip before the return of Israeli hostages held by the Hamas militants. Pope made his appearance at the St. Peter's Basilica on Sunday. Despite concerns over his health, he warned countries against rearming themselves and spoke about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Surface de la terre, et tout arbre dont le fruit porte sa the Pope usually uses special Christian celebrations to draw attention to global issues. This year's Easter, it was the war in Gaza, which has been ongoing for five months. The Pope said, peace is never made with arms, but with outstretched hands and open hearts. While negotiations between Israel and Hamas are due to begin, Pope Francis appealed for humanitarian aid to be ensured to Gaza and for the prompt release of Israeli hostages seized on October 7 and for an immediate ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. Referring to the impact of the war on civilians, beginning with children, he said, How much suffering we see in their eyes. With those eyes they ask us, why? Why all this death? Why all this destruction? War is always an absurdity and a defeat. The Pope then focused on the Russia-Ukraine war, saying he hoped for a general exchange of all prisoners between the two countries. Easter Sunday marks a major part of the Catholic and Christian calendar. This year, Pope Francis was helped into a wheelchair as he greeted cardinals celebrating Easter Mass. He then travelled around St. Peter's Square in the Pope Mobile, waving to large crowds. I guess New Yorkers had plenty of room in their hearts for Jesus and their furry friends because Easter Sunday was spent getting them all dressed up for the annual Easter Parade and Bonnet Festival. A huge number of dogs, cats and their owners wore extravagant costumes in Easter bonnets or traditional hats and waited for mass outside of St. Peter's Cathedral. While there were regular cute costumes, some others chose to make a statement with theirs. Like one of Adam, whose hat was made from plastic bottles, who will be seen in a minute. The parade takes place on Fifth Avenue every year. It's been a New York City tradition since the 1870s. Happy Easter. It's about the pigeon Brooklyn. That's her. That's her. Thank you. Just another excuse to wear costumes, I would say. Thanks for watching the world today. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Have a happy Easter.